Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and welcome to Biology Essentials video 37. This is on cell communication. In other words, how cells communicate with other cells. And what I thought I'd do is start with some analogies. I want to show you how I communicate with other people and how those communications are similar to the communications that we see in cells. So let's first of all start with the post-it note. Post-it wor note works great if you want to take a message and hand it specifically to someone else. And so, for example, let's say I have a grocery list. I write down the things that we need at home. I hand it to my son and I say, please get these things at the store. He can always check on the list to make sure it's matching up with the, uh, the things that we actually require. And so it works great, but you have to hand it off from one person to another. Next is the email. Uh, and so Gmail works great for me. If I want to send a, a message to a student, a specific student, then I send an uh, email. It works great because I can send it to a specific student. Uh, I don't have to physically be next to that person to send it to them. And then the last one would be a Facebook, like a, I don't do many status updates, but if I were to post this, working on communication podcast by myself, ironic. Um, a Facebook status post is not going to one person, it's going to all of my friends. And so then they can determine uh, if they want to like it or dislike it or ignore it or unfriend me as a result of that. And so those are three ways that I communicate with people and that really are similar to the ways that cells communicate. And so the first one is when there's no distance between cells. In other words, when you have to make sure a message gets from one cell to another, then we can use cell-to-cell uh, -cell contact. And so example I'll talk about in this is the antigen presenting cell. And so that's when one cell is sending a message to another. Uh, also, like plant cells, for example, have these little holes called plasmodesmata, and they can actually send messages from cell to cell. Next one I'll talk about are local regulators. If it's a distance that's short and I want to make sure that it goes to one other cell, uh, cell to cell, I could use something called the local regulator. And so example I'll talk about is when you have a neuron connected to another neuron through a synapse, you can send a neurotransmitter to make sure that message gets across. Again, it's going just from one cell to another. Let's say it's a distance that's long or an audience that's large, you want to send that information. Uh, we could use something like a, a hormone. And so the one I'll talk about is human growth hormone. And nice thing about that is you can send it from not only just one cell, or ex excuse me, not to just one cell, you can send it to multiple cells. And then they can figure out based on that message if they really want to act on it or not. And that's why it's a lot like a, uh, a status post. And so let's first of all start with a, a, a cont uh, contact. In other words, specific contact between two cells. And the example I'm using here is the immune response. And so an antigen is an invader. So it could be, for example, a bacteria or a virus. And so we have uh, cells called antigen presenting cells. An example would be a macrophage. And it can actually sense the shape and then pass that off to make antibodies, more macrophages, and then killer T cells. And so what sits in the center of this whole thing is the T helper cell, and it has to know specifically what the shape is. And so let me show you, I've made a little animation that explains this. This is like the post-it note. And so let's say we have our antigen, so we have our virus, and this would be our macrophage. And so what it's gonna do is it's going to grab on to that antigen and it's going to envelop it. Uh, it'll, it'll put it inside this little phagocyte uh, or this little uh, phagosome which is a little bubble. It'll then have a lysosome come next to it that'll spill some digestive enzymes into it and it'll chop it up into a million little pieces. Next it'll let that go but you'll notice as it moves out that it's actually being part of it is being carried to the surface. The shape of a part of that antigen is carried to the surface. And now we have our helper T cell. And so the helper T cell is going to pass off, let me get a uh, marker. It's going to pass that shape to the helper T cell. And so that protein that was inside the macrophage is called the MHC2. It's a protein, major histocompatibility complex 2. Uh, it's just a protein that brings the surface of that antigen to its surface. It's then going to link up with a CD4, which is another protein on the surface of the helper T cell. So let me get all of the scribbling out of the way. So there will actually be a connection between those two cells. And what it's really sending is the shape of that antigen to the helper T cell. 
Okay, now it's activated the helper T cell. It knows the shape of that antigen, so the macrophage isn't required anymore. It's going to go eat some more uh, of those antigens. And now that helper T cell can send that message to a B cell, so it can make uh, plasma cells make more uh, antibodies. It can also make more memory cells. It's also going to activate a killer T cell, and a killer T cell now knows that shape as well, and it's going to target any cell inside our body that's actually infected with that. And so by passing that message off just like a post-it note we're sure of what that shape is. Next one is the idea of a local regulator. Now there's a distance between those two cells but we still have to make sure that message gets across. Perfect example of this would be when neurons are connected. And so a neuron is going to take a message so let's say I poke my finger right here it's going to send that message eventually to my spinal cord eventually to my brain and then back again so I can act on that. And so that message is going to travel in this direction and it's eventually going to hit another neuron and so it's eventually going to have to travel over here but what's interesting is right here where those two neurons come together they're not actually connected now we still want to make sure that message gets across because we want to make sure that message keeps going all the way down here to the brain but they're not connected and so we have to use a local regulator to make sure that message gets across example would be a neurotransmitter and so that message is coming down neuron A and it's going to move down neuron B but the way it works is that we're actually going to release chemicals those are called neurotransmitters they'll move across that synapse or across that gap they're going to open up some other channels, which is eventually going to get an influx of ions, and it's eventually going to send that message on its way. And so these right here, neurotransmitters, uh, are chemicals, and those chemical signals are going to float right across that gap. Now, they're not really going to float out to another uh, neuron. They're quickly going to break down, and so it's just like an email. It's a message going from this cell to this cell. Now, you might think, if you're smart, you might think, what's the point of that? In other words, wouldn't it be smarter to just have those two neurons connected together so the message is going to go across quicker? That's a really good question. And what we think, scientists think, is that by opening it up, by allowing these local regulators to go across, it gives us control over how much of that signal gets through, if it gets through, if we can block the signal so it doesn't get across. And so we think that, that our brains have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger by adding more neurons, but probably what's more important than adding more neurons is the adding these connections between neurons. Uh, let me give you an example of this. I'm a distance runner, and so I love these, uh, beta endorphins. Endorphins are natural opiates made by your body. And what they do is they block pain. And so if you go for a run, here's a Paula Radcliffe, she's a, a marathon runner. If you go for a run and you're out there for 10 minutes, you won't feel these, or 40 minutes, you won't feel these. But a hour, couple hours in, if you're out there for two hours, if you can make it that long, your body is going to start secreting these beta endorphins. And those are neurotransmitters. They'll move into uh, nerves in your central nervous system. What they'll do is they'll block pain. And so even though the signal is actually of pain is traveling into your brain from your, from your body, it really hurts to run that far, you're actually breaking it, um, that connection. And it shows, shows you how it's important to have control over that synapse. Now, humans have created uh, things that mirror this. And so heroin or morphine, they really resemble the structure of endorphins because they're going to trigger those same responses inside our brain. Last thing I want to talk about is that Facebook status post. When you want to send a message and it's going to go to everybody and they're going to figure out how to act on that. An example I'll talk about would be, I mean, this is a hormone that we're not talking about. A hormone is simply going to be a chemical and that chemical is going to spread throughout your whole body. And so an example of one would be the growth hormone. Growth hormone is especially going to be secreted by the pituitary as a human goes through a uh, uh, puberty. And so as your body gets larger and larger and larger, the way that works is we secrete a growth hormone. The cells are going to pick it up. So for example, muscles will grow, bones will grow. Um, and here's actually a list of all the things that will happen uh, as we increase the amount of uh, growth hormone. So for example, all of the organs will grow, but the brain won't grow. And we'll get glucogenesis in the liver or uptake of glucose or um, it stimulates the immune response. In other words, all of these cells in your body are receiving that same message from human growth hormone, but they're acting on that. And so that's like that status post. It goes to everybody, 
but you can choose to like it or ignore it or act as a result of that. Sometimes the message will go out of control. And so this is Robert Wadlow. Robert Wadlow is a pituitary giant. And the reason he was a pituitary giant, we now know, is that he had a tumor that was pushing on his pituitary gland. As a result of that, he created more human growth hormone and more human growth hormone and more human growth hormone. And you can see that he was, I don't know, well over eight feet tall. Um, and so this is just a hormone and it's acting on all the cells in your body. And so when the distance is large and you want to touch a lot of different cells, um, you're going to use something like a hormone. And so that's how cells communicate. It's not that different from the way that we communicate. Uh, you just have to know your audience and send a message that's appropriate. So I hope that's helpful.